I have Simon Smith here today from London. Thank you for inviting me on. I've done a number of things in, in my career over the years, but what we're currently focused on is, is Excalibur, which is a audio web-free audio platform where we're enabling people to upload their content and mint an audio NFT of that content and then distribute it to their audience, enabling their audience to buy the NFT as well. Effectively, it's, it's a crowdfunding of their content an alternative to the the system that has evolved in Web2, where we have a small number of Web2 platforms that distribute media, sometimes through subscription, sometimes free, other things of advertising. But yeah, we feel like there's a real scope here for a pay-as-you-go solution. And the technologies that we've developed with the micropayment ability with cryptocurrencies and NFTs as being media content that you can own and store within your own wallet really offer great opportunities for the future of media distribution and monetization for creators. Okay. And for me, the lack of censorship on your platform is a big deal. You're a heavily a supporter of free speech, right? And that's one of the reason, reasons why you're doing what you're doing? Absolutely. Yeah. We, we believe in free speech and uh, we, we feel like the internet, you know, really has from the beginning been an opportunity for free speech. If, if you remember, like we're both old enough to remember what it was like before the internet existed. And, the people that broadcast were the radio stations, the TV stations, you know, everything was very effectively controlled by the people that ran those companies. Obviously in the UK, we've got the BBC, which is a state-run media platform, which should be impartial on things. That's their remit is to be impartial. But yeah, the, the private radio stations, TV stations, you know, they have people that run them, they have people that are funding them. So I guess there is a level of control over what goes out on those centralized platforms. But with the invention of the internet, you know, anyone that could either build a website or pay a web developer to build a website actually had the opportunity to broadcast for the first time in history. It was a democratization of mass media, really, in many ways. So I'm I'm very enthusiastic about, you know, what we can still achieve with the internet. I feel like Web2 has really been an unfortunate direction that we've taken because it's it's really in a centralization into a few big media platforms that have ended up controlling content. But Podcasting in particular, I find fascinating because it's the spoken word. You know, I mean, having a website is one thing. If people actually sit down and read what you've written on that website, then that's an, ach an achievement. But many, many people are quite passive in their consumption of media. And we like to have things read to us or spoken to us, or we like videos to watch. So I, I feel like podcasting is a step up in terms of having a wider reach to your audience. And it, yeah, it, it's. In, in many ways, it's it's a conversation that, that we're able to record, but it's in many cases, it's a fascinating conversation. I mean, I'm a big fan of podcasts and audio books. I love the fact that I can go to the gym or I can walk to the office or I can be driving and I can educate myself and, and find out new stuff all the time and, and learn new stuff. Even though I'm now 50 years old, I feel like I'm probably learning more than I've ever learned in my life just because accessibility that I have with audio content. I put one of my podcasts up already on your platform, and I wanted to explore the censorship idea a little more that no one else can take it down, right? Once I put it up there, even if they say something politically incorrect, it's going to stay up there, correct? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's on Arweave effectively. Yeah, so Arweave is the storage medium that we're using, which is a decentralized collection of computers where the content is stored. We, as Excalibur, once we've up enabled somebody to be uploaded to Arweave, we don't really have control over that. I mean, we, we have control over what's on Excalibur. So, yeah, we, we, can, we can remove a listing from Excalibur and potentially in the cases of breach of copyright, um, we, we would probably do that. But... Yeah, you know, we are pro-free free speech. So if someone's making their opinion heard, then, then we support that. And what we think all opinions should be heard. We don't, we don't believe in anyone being muted because some people don't like what other people are saying. And I, I'm always of the opinion that the solution to bad speech is more speech. So if you hear something you don't like, then get out there and make your own broadcast and disagree with what they're saying and offer facts and information that support your point of view. And Let's have the discussion. You know, the, the idea that anything should not be turrets about, I think it's probably uh, not, not really practical. I have some more questions about Excalibur, but let's talk about your uh, views on global warming. What do you think is happening here? Yeah, global warming, they've actually changed the, the name of it now. It's now called climate change, isn't it? So we've kind of gone from uh, back in the 70s, there was quite a lot of scientists that were predicting 
another ice age and then they, they moved on to global warming i remember that was kind of when i was at school i started hearing about that yeah it was the concept that if you have a difference in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere then that results in storage of heat and uh, yeah that's the, the global warming theory and i think it's important to say it is a theory and this is the way that science is supposed to work is that people create hypotheses and over time they become theories and the, the job of science is to try to refute a hypothesis or to disprove a theory and things should always be questioned they should always be you know examined the facts of the people that propose the theory should be examined critically and so yeah i mean Climate change, I guess, they're moving away from the concept of global warming. I'm not sure, perhaps, they're, they're finding that the world isn't getting hot, hotter as, as fast as they thought it was, and perhaps they're now looking for a different way of trying to take control of the way things get produced in the world. So that's ultimately what it comes down to, is the people trying to influence the, the ways that things are produced or the way that we live our lives, and having a kind of righteous cause for doing that. Yeah, I mean, throughout history, there's always been people that want to control the way that other people live their socialism. There's been a big effort out of that. Obviously, the experiments that we did during the 20th century with communist states didn't really work out very well. You know, in my experience, it has been, you know, the market economy, which has resulted in the most uh, wealth, the most people, the most opportunity for the most people. So, yeah, I think we should always be skeptical of anyone that's trying to find these righteous causes that ultimately result in people being controlled because quite often the motivation isn't necessarily for cause itself it's actually at the fact they can use that to control people so yeah i think you know we should we should definitely examine the idea of global warming or climate change and we should consider the the facts and the figures that are being put forward to us and i think i've got to say one of the things that really concerns me about the whole global warming movement is that it's not socially acceptable to question whether this is actually a thing or not. You know, in general, in modern industrial civilized society, if you do question whether global warming is a real thing or not, then people do tend to look at you like you're crazy or like you're some kind of flat earth person. I don't know the flat earth people. I mean, you know, that's maybe not the best example, but you're a conspiracy theorist. You know, that's, that's the thing. You're not somebody who's think that a scientific attitude of let's examine the facts here and let's let's try and consider whether we've got the right view of the truth you know you are somebody who's obviously got a hidden agenda and maybe you're secretly working for an oil company and you're just trying to promote their interests but you're obviously not respecting the science as it were and i say the science because that's what people try to refer to i mean what we're not actually believing is the scientists and i think we do have to remember that the scientists are human beings you know they are people that have mortgages, they have children to feed, and they need to earn money. And it is a fact in science that scientists are on research projects, and those projects last for as long as they are funded. When the funding dries up for a particular project, they have to go and find a new project to work on. So no scientists really have permanent jobs, and the extent to which their projects will continue depends upon them finding results that justify more funding for those projects. So there is an incentive system there in terms of scientists as human beings being incentivized to find results that conform with the essentially with the agenda of the, the wider scientific community, but also conform with the interests, the people that are actually paying for that research to be done. So if, if there is a, a, a body or a, an organization that is paying for a particular research project, then they are incentivized to to have you know results found that, that that suit their particular political objectives or economic objectives or whatever it is that they're hoping to promote so yeah i mean you know science is not unbiased this is a fact and, and this is why it's important that we all are able to keep an open mind and we're all able to question things and that's probably why i take the position i'm, I'm much more skeptical about global warming if for no other reason than general society says I shouldn't be. <laughs> For me, that's that's a good reason to be very skeptical of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've spent time on the internet, you know, researching facts and figures. And one of the fascinating things I've found is that over the last 20,000 years, the average rise in the sea level has been six millimeters a year. And when you examine a more recent period of 120 years, running from 1900 through to 
2020, the average rise in the sea level is about 1.7 millimetres a year. So if anyone is listening to this and they question my figures, then you can research this on Google. Or if you want to do it even more quickly, you can ask ChatGBT. And the funny thing about ChatGBT when it answers this question is that it states the stats and it says, okay, 20,000 years, average sea level rise, six mils. And it then says, and now it's much faster in the last 120 years, it's going up by 1.7 millimeters a year. And you, you, the good thing about ChatGPT is you can actually do a follow-on question. You can ask it, well, hang on a minute, aren't you wrong there? Because 1.7 is less than six millimeters. And ChatGPT then, I mean, obviously all it's doing is just sourcing its information from the internet. And the internet says that sea levels are rising faster than they used to, but the stats are different. So it's, it's stating both as it finds on the internet. It's stating the stats and it's stating the opinion of the internet, which is that sea levels are rising faster. And it's kind of contradicting itself quite severely. But ChatGPT is pretty, pretty good, you know, in terms of being able to, you know, work with natural language and, understand information and respond to your query. So when you, you question it on the, the, you know, the factual inconsistency of what it's saying, it then responds and says, oh, yes, whatever, well, the last 20,000 years has been massively varied, you know, and it's been, you know, coming out of an ice age and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, it just means that at times it's been rising a whole lot faster than six millimeters a year. The thing it does draw attention to is the last 30 years where it's it's been faster. You know, I think it, it's gone from about 1.2 millimeters a year up to about three, I think, in the last 30 years. There has been an acceleration more recently. I mean, obviously, the Industrial Revolution has been going on since 1750 onwards. You know, use of hydrocarbons has been gradually increasing through then, you know, through the last you know, nearly 300 years now. So, you know, if there was a correlation, then you would expect to have seen, you know, a much higher rise in sea level over the last 120 years years so yeah i mean it's it's interesting but certainly chat you know echoes the consensus of the internet that is sea levels are rising faster because of human activity and because of using hydrocarbons yeah i mean it's it's interesting to be able to do that kind of research because the other thing that you can ask chat gpt about is the amount of energy that human beings consume versus the amount of energy that the sun creates on the planet during the course of any period of time. So if you take the, you know, it's a one hour time unit, then look at how much kilowatt hours are landing on the earth from the sun and how much energy is being produced by the human race by burning hydrocarbons. And the ratio is three to 100 million. That's quite a lot. You know, that's, that, that, that does mean that the amount of energy that we're consuming versus the amount of energy that's landing on the planet is an absolute slightest drop in the ocean. That's three parts to 100 million. That really is a very small amount. And I mean, yeah, if you make, you know, this identification to a climate change scientist that will say, oh, no, it's not about that. It's all about the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You know, that's, that's what's causing it because that's concentrating the heat closer to the planet. Of course, you know, there is that fact as well that people have greenhouses, you know, real greenhouses, not the, uh, the scientific hypothesized greenhouses. They pump carbon dioxide into those greenhouses because that's what makes plants grow more. So in reality, having more carbon dioxide on the planet is going to be making plants grow faster. This is one of the many ways in which nature is very much a self-correcting system and adjusts to different conditions because obviously throughout history, there's probably been times when there has been much more carbon dioxide on the planet and, and times when there has been less. These things do vary over time, you know, and, and definitely, you know, sea levels are rising, not very fast in the context of history, but they are rising. And, you know, maybe it's possible that it is being caused by human beings, but certainly the rate at which they are rising isn't a cause for alarm in any historical context. And certainly the amount of energy that we're using is a very small fraction of the amount of energy that we're actually reabsorbing into the planet at any one point in time. I find the whole thing fascinating because, you know, in reality, what human beings really need is the right amount of energy in the right places at the right time. So what we're using is is a form of battery. You know, hydrocarbons are a form of battery. And we we may, you know, develop better forms of battery over time. But what, you know, the, the, the way that we've managed to develop as a civilization using hydrocarbons has, has been incredible. You know, and I think it really has enabled us to do so many things and eliminate poverty 
and you know make a better quality of life for people you know even just you know 50 100 years ago people's ability to have reliable heating sources through the winter would have would have been a, a real source of uncertainty for a lot of people you know, the systems were developed to really make life a much more comfortable and a much better experience for most people. So I'm curious as to how you got to where you are as a climate skeptic. Was there a time when you believed and you had some aha moment or were you skeptical the whole time? And then also, how are you staying up with what's happening in the debate? Are you just reading mainstream media or reading any books or what are you doing? I think as a, as a teenager, you know, you hear about climate change and you know, there's that old thing of you know, anyone who is um, uh, not a liberal at 18 probably doesn't have a heart and anyone who's still a liberal at 28 probably doesn't have a brain you know, <laughs> there's, you know it's a little hard first rule but there's an element of that in all of us you know and i think as, as a teenager you're hearing about this idea and think, oh that's terrible we're killing the planet you know it's such an awful thing you know and we tend to respect science and scientists you know i mean i think that's that's still an important distinction there between science and scientists because science is the process of discovery and questioning and scientists are human beings. You know, that's, I think that's the important thing. If you're looking at what the truth is, you've got to make that important distinction. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose I was always been a bit skeptical. In, in reality, when I was a teenager, being a believer in global warming was actually being a skeptic at the time. You know? <laughs> most, most, people, most people thought you were some kind of tree hugger if you believed in global warming back then. But, but yeah, I mean, my, my professional career, the last 20 years, I've been an investor and so I've been invested in securities, futures, options, done a lot of angel investing in startup companies. And the way that I've kind of found I can be very successful at that is by being very skeptical, by questioning whatever people tell me. So in, in many ways, I've honed my mind to always question what people tell me and to never take anything on on kind of some say-so or never assume that any kind of, you know, kind of data is is true. I, I always had a tendency to go and do research for myself. And it's got to be said, the internet is a great research tool. You know, you can look at many different sources of information. You can cross-reference those things against each other. You can drill down into the, the facts that are built on other facts. You know, you, you can explore so much data and so much information and you can find people with different opinions. You can test out what they say by exploring the, the precepts of, of their opinions. And I find all this stuff fascinating. You know, it's what I do for fun. You know, I'm that kind of geeky kind of data research kind of person. And it's worked out well for me because, you know, I've been quite successful in, in calling out a lot of misconceptions that have existed in the financial markets over the years. You know, it, it's certainly the case that there's a lot of groupthink in the financial markets and Quite often, a lot of these things do come down to financial incentives. You know, you, you have to look at you know who is profiting from a particular kind of narrative. Yeah, so I think for me, I probably started to become skeptical of climate change scientists about 15 years ago, prompted by a program on TV, Channel 4, called The Great Global Warming Swindle, <laughs> which was the first time I really saw anyone actually question the whole global warming thing and it, it was interesting and i mean that program came up with a, a lot of a lot of bad press and there was a climate change scientist that did a retort to that in a, a three episode series and I, I watched that one and i carefully followed everything he was saying and i could see some logical flaws there that's quite often what it is you know where it's okay so the, the world won't be getting hotter but is it necessarily being caused by human beings and he didn't really kind of fulfill that that kind of argument properly so it looked like there was something missing there the people that have been you know collecting temperature change data for the last 50 years you know the traveling around and going out camping and, and checking their their results everywhere we're having kind of a nice life doing that you know there's this there's, there's a kind of a bit of an implication there that that you know they, they, they really want to find some results they don't want to find that temperature isn't increasing or none of it can be caused by human beings because they'll be out of a job you know it, it's a sad fact but it's you know there is that incentive system that we're all human beings we've all got to make money you know particularly you know if you're in a position where perhaps you're in the middle of your life you're not a teenager anymore and you know you, you've got financial responsibilities you know you need to find ways to earn money and maybe sometimes people do compromise their principles as they get a bit older and, and are willing to maybe find some stats that maybe aren't actually the, the real ones that they found and maybe that bolsters the theory that they're trying to prove and they can get another research grant to carry on researching what they're doing and you know i'm not naming names here i'm not pointing fingers at anyone and all i'm saying is 
the incentive system does kind of suggest that there could be some fake results in the system. And I think, you know, let's do some more research on that. Let's maybe have some bodies that are actually funded to find that climate change isn't happening, or maybe it's not caused by human beings. And, and let's see what they can find. You know, let's have the alternative argument, because what I'm seeing is that there is a huge amount of money focused on finding climate change results and finding that it is caused by human beings. So, so yeah, have- the interesting thing I find is in the last couple of years, there's loads more people that are actually questioning whether climate change scientists are telling the truth or not. And I, I've been trying to figure this way out in the last few months. Saying, why is it now that so many people, because I, you know, I was a heretic. I was the person that was obviously crazy or conspiracy theorist or whatever it was that made me think that climate change wasn't real. You know, and now, now see people are joining this cause, which I think is great. You know, and I welcome as many people on there on in the world to come and question this stuff. But I'm wondering what it is that's causing it. And it may have actually been COVID because I think there's a general acceptance that, that's come to the fore now that, that lockdown was the wrong thing. It wasn't really justified. You know, I mean, okay, there was a virus and people were dying from it. We shut down the world for this. You know, we damaged the economy. You know, we caused the inflation that we currently have. I, I really feel for anybody that was in any kind of domestic abuse situation or difficult home life situation that was locked down during that period. You know, and no one really considered these implications. Everyone just said, oh, yeah, impact on the health services, you can't let people die. I mean, you know, there was an obvious middle path there was to say anyone that is, you know, maybe also immune compromised or in an old and weak situation, then you should definitely stay at home. We recommend you do that. Because if you do go out, you do so at your own risk and you run the risk of dying. And we ask you not to, because that's going to put a pressure on the health services. And you've got to remember that, you know, in any given year, there's, there's probably one to 2% of the population that are going to die. You know, and there are people that are close to death. And things like respiratory illnesses are often the things that take people over the edge, you know. So these things happen. It's very unfortunate, you know, but it's a reality of life for all of us. So I do wonder if it's actually the fact that scientists have been shown to be wrong, you know, and we have held scientists in very high esteem quite a long time, you know, seeing them to be almost the kind of the new religion where they can't be questioned. I think we're now seeing that scientists can actually be wrong. I think we are, you know, as as a population now starting to question what scientists tell us, and I think this is a good thing. I'm very interested in your perspective. Uh, you've been heavily involved in the tech world and the investing world for decades now. What have you seen as you've been meeting with people over time? Did it come up a lot that people really thought that CO2 was going to kill us all? Or what have you heard out there? Yeah, I mean, people in the tech world, I guess, they, they tend to be quite narrow thinking. They tend to be quite looking you know, at, at their particular gadgets or systems that they're trying to build. I think the it's more the humanities, the people in the kind of the more the social sciences that look out at the um, the wider world and the wider implications. So yeah, tech tech people generally not that focused on climate change, in my experience. But yeah, I, yeah, I suppose th- th- there have been technologies that have purported to improve, you know, kind of use of fuels. So yeah, I can I can see that's quite a, a motivator. Here's, here's a good story. I remember years ago, I was invested in a startup company along with a, another guy, and he had started investing in this new company that was apparently turning rubbish into diesel. <laughs> and he said, would you like to invest as well? And I said, oh, well, let's go and have a look at this machine. It sounds amazing. And then it turned out the machine was locked up in a garage in Spain, and we couldn't go and look at the machine because the entrepreneur had been double-crossed by a previous investor and we didn't have access to it. So we just had to take it on trust. But it was also it was okay because he got some of the diesel fuel that come out of the machine and he'd taken it to a lab and he got it tested and it turned out it was diesel. So it was okay. And I'm like, but where did he get that from? He could have got that from the gas station down the road, you know. So, you know, it, it was kind of like, you know, this – this kind of investment was obviously being motivated partly by people's desire to be more green and, and more kind of in favor of, you know, the kind of technologies that could make a better world. So, yeah, I mean, in investing, that there is a lot of bullshit, particularly in startup investing. I mean, the whole thing with Elizabeth Holmes, I mean, you know, she must have upset somebody because there are so many startups out there that are lying and faking results. Honestly, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't wish to like, you know, cast aspersions upon the industry in which I, Populate, but I mean, there, there are many startups that make stuff up in order to get funding. You know, she she definitely got caught out on that. You know, she was definitely proven to be 
positively faking results and you know she she obviously if she's found guilty she deserves to go to prison for it but you know there is a lot of this goes on in a startup world and there are many companies out there that are very good and are trying to do great things and, and will succeed there are many others that are good and are trying to do good things and, and will just fail and most will fail in reality and there's always that percentage out there that are just you know faking results and they're going to raise some money and they're going to take their salaries for a few years and when it all doesn't work out, they're going to go on and reinvent themselves as, as something else and raise some more money to do something. You know, there's plenty of professional fundraising machines out there. You know, that's that's what I've seen. And I guess that, that's what leads me to skepticism. That's what leads me to question a lot of what I see. I, I see a lot of fantastical claims that, that don't necessarily fulfill anything. And I, I'm a great fan of history as well, I think. You know, I mean, looking at history, that there is always a doomsday scenario in, in some ways as human beings. We are naturally inclined to to believe in a doomsday scenario. I don't know what part of our evolution benefits from this, but it's you know it's the whole point of cried wolf kind of thing. You know, we 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 all kind of had the AIDS epidemic when we were young, and that was going to kill us all. And you know, when I was at school in geography, they were telling me there was thirty years of oil and gas left supply, and now thirty years later, they're telling me there's about thirty years of oil and gas left supply. You know. <laughs> It's yeah, you know, the information always has opinion in it. You know, that's that's what you have to realize. You know, that there is no such thing as as, as true information. You know, it, 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 everything has embedded biases and opinions in, in them, and I think you know, we all have to accept that and try to work with it to, to do our research and, and and find out the truth as much as we can. You were an early Bitcoin investor, right? And I think that it looks like. People are going to try to shut down Bitcoin mining because of climate change, like you know, Bitcoin mining causes hurricanes or something. Do you think they're going to have any success in tamping down Bitcoin because of that, because of the climate scam? Yeah, it's an interesting one, that one. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I got to Bitcoin in 2013. Initially, I have to say, I was I really just kind of jumped on board the bandwagon. I didn't really understand what it was. Um, but you know, I've, I've studied studied it a lot more recently and really gone down the rabbit hole. And that's one of the things that motivated me to start Excalibur was just the concept of crypto as a payment system. You know, and it is a much better payment system than anything we've had before. It's a real native digital currency for the internet. You know, and it really is. So, you know, if anyone's listening, I advise you: don't take my word for it. Go and do your own research. Go and find out about crypto and Bitcoin and how it really can make things better for us in the, the financial space and also the media distribution space. I think we've got real opportunities there. But yeah, in terms of the whole energy usage, to me, that's very much a red herring. It's the kind of thing that works really well with newspaper headlines. It works really well for people that potentially feel like cryptocurrencies might take away power from the existing governments, the existing banking system, just as the powers that be. It's, it's a convenient way for them to get at Bitcoin because it uses 0.4% of the world's energy usage. So yeah, I mean, when when you actually look in more detail at the way that Bitcoin uses energy and the way that the proof of work mechanism works, any miner that's using electricity at the kind of anything close to the normal retail cost of electricity is losing money. So there's no incentive for them to take electricity away from any domestic or commercial usage that could actually use it. They really have to find places where electricity is cheaper in order to actually mine Bitcoin effectively. So it actually becomes a force for good in terms of funding innovation and development of energy sources that might otherwise not be very convenient. For example, hydro stations in remote parts of the world, which previously wouldn't have been able to be developed because they're too far from any actual conurbation. And so Bitcoin mine can locate itself there, they can fund the development of the hydro station. And then the fact that the electricity exists there and it's relatively low cost, then means it's cheaper for companies to base themselves there or for residential estates to base themselves there as well. So when you actually get down into detail of it, Bitcoin is actually a force for finding cheaper, more efficient sources of electricity. But the, the, one of the, the more obvious things that I think can be used to counter that for anyone that's out there in, in the media and is really going to trying to shut down Bitcoin mining is, let's look at air conditioning. And I've got to say, I've been to quite a lot of conferences over the years, and the classic one is always Miami, because you have those incredibly large conference centers, you know, with the very high ceilings. And you leave your hotel on the day, you know, Miami's a very warm place, so you're in your shorts and t-shirt, and you go into the conference center, and you are freezing your balls off, because they're running the air con, 
at far too low a temperature. And it's crazy to me because it's like this massive building with a very high ceiling and they're turning it into a massive fridge. And it's not comfortable for anyone. You know, the second day you go back with your hat and your scarf and your coat on because you know you're going to be freezing in there. And fortunately, I'm from England where it's generally pretty cold. And, you know, I, I carry around my hat and my scarf everywhere I go, you know, because I don't like being cold. So, yeah, I mean, then, then of course, you're sitting in the conference and somebody comes on stage and starts talking about global warming. You just want to get up there to the microphone and say, let's switch off the fucking <laughs> air conditioning. Because it's freezing us all, and you're burning a lot of fossil fuels to make us all feel very uncomfortable. I mean, it's not just the conference centers. I've been in restaurants in New York. You know, New York in the summer is nice and hot, and you get excited, and it's freezing, isn't it? You know, it's shockingly cold. I remember going to a Japanese restaurant where they had a seven course tasting menu. And I, I said, can you just like bring the courses a bit more quickly? Because I'm so cold in here. You know, it's not doing any good for anyone. So, if people out there that, that want to create legislation that, that reduces the amount of fossil fuels that we use, you've actually got a much quicker win there. Rather than focusing on Bitcoin mining, let's focus on stupidly using air conditioning and setting it anything lower than about 25 degrees Celsius, which I think in America that's equivalent to about 77 Fahrenheit, you know, which is a normal room temperature. You know, if you, you know, I'm, I'm all for air conditioning. You know, I, I think it's it's great that on a hot date we can be nice and comfortable inside a building, and you know, let's let's go ahead and do that. Let's bring the temperature down to something that's that's comfortable for for us, and and you know, is is maybe using some fossil fuels. You know, that's 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 what they're there for. But let's not overuse it. Let's not make ourselves uncomfortable and waste fuel at the same time. It just doesn't make sense. And if legislators want to do something that's worthwhile, then there's something for them to focus on. You know, let's do that. I am planning to put this podcast up on your platform. And I just wanted to talk about that a little bit that I put it up there and people will listen to it through a browser, right? Right now, or is there an app that they can use? Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we are a decentralized platform. We believe in decentralized technologies and our, our view that anything in the app store is actually centralized. It's all been censored by Apple or Google restrict what goes into the app store. So, you know, we, we have a, a web app, which is optimized to work on mobile and on uh, a normal desktop browser. Anyone that's listening, if you'd like to support this podcast, then you can do so by minting an NFT of the podcast. So when Tom uploads the content, it will mint into an NFT on the blockchain, which means it will be there as a, as a digital record, an audio NFT, which is a relative thing you see. I think there's some music NFT platforms out there, but podcast NFTs, it, it's a different way of funding content. So Tom, as far as I know, you don't really put ads in your content, do you? No, no. Nope. No, so it, it, it's it's probably less relevant for this one, but you know, as a demonstration of technology, and it, in order to support the podcast, if you mint that NFT, then it would be great because you can show that to people, you can demo it to people, and uh, that would be great for us at Excalibur. It'd also be a nice way to get Tom's podcast on a, a wider reach, and the, you can actually generate an affiliate link for yourself. So if you want to make money out of this yourself, you can. And generate a fitting link, which will create a new smart contract um, where your wallet address will automatically receive 50% of the revenue and that is generated by NFT sales of people that you send it to. So let's get the word out there about Tom's podcast, about being skeptical about misinformation that might be delivered to us by an incentive system that is potentially not in our best interests at heart. You know, I, I don't blame anyone individually for the choices that they're making, but I think you know, we, we need to question the system, really, and then look for ways that we can improve the system. And that's what Excalibur is. It, it's potentially a better system for media distribution because by being the distributors, by engaging in peer-to-peer -peer distribution of content, you're circumventing the middleman of the advertiser. And when you are consuming content through an advertised funding platform, that the incentive there, of course, is for the advertiser to push content on you, which generates the most advertising revenue. Whereas in Excalibur, the incentive for us as members of the network is to distribute content that is of the highest quality. So we are potentially forming a new form of algorithm here, a web-free algorithm, where we as a network, not much as a human intelligence network, will deliver the best quality content to each other. 
that's what we hope to do at Excalibur. Okay. And you might have to explain part of this like I'm five. So for example, I listened to several episodes of your podcast over the weekend and I just listened to it through Chrome. I went to the URL where I knew your podcast was. And then in Chrome, I listened to it. Is that the way that people should be listening to stuff on, on a iPhone, for example? That's it. Yeah, that's the the URL link that can be sent to people through WhatsApp or by email or through Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. You know, we've designed an application that runs over the existing rails of the internet. You know, we thought, why why reinvent the wheel? You know, we have plenty of communication channels out there. And all you you really need to do is have a link that you can share with people. And, you know, it's your personal recommendation. The best media content I find tends to come from recommendation from other people. So that's that's the human network that we're utilizing here. Is you know, we, we've all got connectivity through de- various different apps on the internet, and Excalibur can work in synergy with those different apps to to share content. And then yeah, the, the monetization system is using crypto. Where the transaction fees are incredibly low. We built on Solana, which enables the, the minting of the NFT, but also yeah, the transaction fees are so low that it's it's not. That you can make very small payments, you know, if, if you want the NFT price to be low for your content and make it a real crowdfunded enterprise where multiple people pay just, you know, 50 cents or a dollar for your content, then if you have a wide audience, you know, you can still generate quite a lot of money for your content. But the fact that being able to make small payments where if, if the payment was being done using Visa or MasterCard, then they would be taking 20 cents, potentially more out of each, trans- each transaction. Using crypto means that the fractions of one cent are being paid as transaction fees. The payments are instant. So for creators that sometimes wait for months for the check to come through from the uh, platform for the, the streaming fees that they've been earning, you know, the payments are instant with crypto. So yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it might seem like a, a more unusual thing where it's, it's a web based app and it's a URL that you're sending around. Uh, it might take a, a little bit of getting used to, but this is the technology that we've arrived upon. I think one of the things that we were thinking of initially was a, a file that would have a, a QR code and you would scan that QR code from inside your WhatsApp, but technology isn't there. You can't scan a QR code from inside your phone. <laughs> it's just no. not possible. You'd have to get another phone and, and put that on top and scan it. So our solution was to have this uh, web-based platform where the content is held, you, know, you generate your affiliate link, which is just, just an alternative URL where the money that's paid will go into your wallet or 50% of the money that's paid will go into your wallet. So in that scenario, you're doing a job for the creator, the creator that you've chosen to follow, that you've chosen to distribute their content. I think in general, the network will rely upon the fact that you're not going to pollute your channel with rubbish content. You're only going to share stuff that you really feel is worthwhile and that you feel confident that when people listen to it, they'll be motivated to purchase the NFT or to share it further. Yeah, that's that's the kind of distillation of quality that we hope to achieve with Excalibur. They need to have a link to a podcast. They can't go to Excalibur yes. and then search for content, but you can go to Google and search for content and maybe find an Excalibur link. Is that possible? Or- yeah, I think at, at some point, yeah, we're with yeah, with a lot more content on our platform, a lot more following, yeah, there's going to yeah. be a lot of backlinks to, to Excalibur there. So yeah, it will potentially pop up on, on Google searches, but what yeah. we are really looking forward to is get, getting to the point where we've got sufficient content on the platform. That we can start to use the intelligence that's been generated by the people and by by effectively upvoting content. I mean, we could do upvotes on Reddit or we could do likes on Twitter and Facebook. But those things are when you actually make a payment on Excalibur, you're making a clearly positive decision to part with your hard-earned money to support the creator. So that's a much stronger upvote and it's going to be a much better definition of quality for an algorithm, which will power our green room, which will ultimately become a metaverse at some point <laughs> with multiple rooms in it, where you can go and find the best content as determined by how much people paid for it. Yeah, and so we, we see that as a potential public gallery, really, where the the votes of the, the network, of, of the, the crowd have delivered something to you where they're saying, this is, this is what we think is worthwhile. And with sufficient content on the platform, somebody can go into that green room and say, right, I want to hear about climate change today. And then the podcasts or the, the audio books that have delivered the content that got most support from their audience, those are the ones that will be at the top of the list. So it's, it's a whole new version of search. I know ChatGPT is probably stealing the game on search from Google right now, but we're hoping there's, there's an opportunity there for human intelligence to be used 
to power that kind of algorithm in the future where it's it's people looking for good content, people valued recommendation of other human beings that have really taken the time to listen and decide what is actually good. Is there any connection between what you're doing and this podcasting 2.0? Or is that a separate thing? Podcasting 2.0, 2.0 is a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's Adam Curry he's doing that when I, I met him. And yeah, he's he's been a podcaster for years. Really respect what he does. And what they do with Lightning is great. You know, I, I think, you know, that is micro payments. That's exactly what we want to see. We want to see people making payments to fund content rather than relying upon the advertising model, which is ultimately just centralized and puts the power in the hands of the advertisers to control what content is delivered to people. They're enabling people to vote with their money using Lightning. I hope they're able to build a kind of green room over time as well. The main difference that we have being on Solana is that people that pay can get an NFT. So you can have that content in your wallet. And it's it's like um, the equivalent of hearing a song at the radio and going out and buying the record, like those old folks like us used to do. <laughs> we used to go and buy the, the vinyl record. I think vinyl's coming back now, aren't they? DJs, DJs are preferring vinyl, aren't they? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that's that's what an NFT is. It's a digital record. You know, it's it. it I, I find it fascinating that we've, we've gone through this process of digitization and we've moved from having physical ownership of media assets to one where almost all of our content is centrally held on, on servers and we access it through apps. You know, it, it just it just puts the control in the hands of very few. And I, I don't believe, you know, the American government or the British government are in any way authoritarian. I don't expect them to start censoring or burning books at any, any, any point soon. But, you know, we have to recognize that there have been times in history where there have been authoritarian regimes and they have burned books. And if we were to end up in a, a situation like that again, it would be so easy for them to throw the switch and, and shut down centralized content you know the, the, that we think we've actually paid for you know you could have a situation where you buy a book from audible and it's in your third party app you can't give that to somebody else and you can't sell that to somebody else you, you don't really own it you know it's it's you, you kind of got a lease on it you know, until they decide that you don't have that lease anymore you know and if you check your terms and conditions you know it's probably I don't check that, I have to admit but certainly with an nft alternative you know you you have that asset within your wallet so yeah, you bought it. It's yours. You can sell it, sell it to somebody else. You can give it to somebody else. You can yeah, you can distribute it more widely, and that's what we want. You know, we want people to the, the audience to be the people that distribute this content. We want the audience to be part of the community, essentially earn money by distributing content to to have ownership of the, the you know the content that they choose to distribute. You know, that's that's what we believe in here at Excalibur. So yeah, NFTs. I think you know there's been that crazy. Crazy bubble with board apes, and crazy JPEGs that have been valued at incredibly high prices. But if you see beyond that bubble and you look at it as a technology where you can have JPEGs is one thing, audio is another, video is another, maybe three D experiences, all of these things can be minted into NFTs, and they can be owned in your own wallet. In the same way as Bitcoin is a revolution in money by enabling you to own your own money in your own wallet without the need for a third party. Because if you think about it, you know, we used to have, we still have dollar notes and pound notes, but they're slowly going out in circulation and everything's being replaced by digital money. You could only own that digital money in the bank. And if you're worried about Silicon Valley Bank going down, well, maybe you're a bit late for that one, you want to take your money out of the bank, you know, there's a limit on how much cash you can take out of the bank, right? And the digital money, you can't own it outside of the bank. You know, it has to be within the banking system. So you can move it to another bank. Bitcoin is a revolution because it enables you to own your own money in your own wallet and to you know to do a transaction with somebody else on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without the need for that centralized third party. NFTs are media assets that you can own with your own wallet and you can send them to somebody else without the need for a third party. So it puts the control back in the hands of the, of the people. You know, it's a democratization of money in the case of Bitcoin, of the media in the case of like Ethereum and Solana, you know, the, the smart contracts that are enabled on those platforms and the NFTs that they deliver. There's only Bitcoin maximalists listening. You know, there is a use case there. I know it's hard to see when there's been so many scam projects and so many silly projects with, with NFTs. You know, there is a real technology and it's fundamentally, it's paying per use for media items. You know, we see ourselves, one of our strong use cases, if you look at Excalibur as a pay-as-you-go Patreon, so with Patreon, you might be listening to content on Spotify or YouTube. You decide you really like that creator. So you make 
the policy decision to leave that website, to go onto Patreon, search for that creator, and then you put in your credit card details and your name and address, and then you enter into subscription. So with Excalibur, whilst you're listening to content, you can connect your wallet and you can mint the NFT down there. If you don't want to pay for the NFT, you can make a small donation. You can do your affiliate link, you can join the chat room, you can do all of that on the same page whilst listening to the content. So in my view, it's a step up on Patreon. I don't know about you, Tom, but subscriptions, do you like them? I do not. No, no I mean, the, the, the consistently, you know, you're reading a newspaper, you, you, know, you search for an article, you find that one article you want to read, but it's kind of paywall. And I've got to say, a lot of newspapers weren't going to pay well just as COVID got started. I don't know if you noticed that, but the, the paywalls went up March 2020, the moment everyone wanted to read the news all day long and they were stuck in yeah. home. And all of a sudden, newspapers went behind paywalls. But anyway, yeah, um, yeah, you, you, you might want to pay 50 cents or one dollar for that one article, but do you really want to enter into a subscription for like seven ninety nine a month for that newspaper? Because you know you're not going to use it. And of course, they offer you the free trial for two weeks, and you think, oh, yeah, free trial. I'm never going to cancel it. You forget it. It gets stuck in your bank account. It's a con. You know, I, I think a lot of these things are, you know, just not good for the consumer. They're not really good for the creator either, because you know, creators historically have had a good feedback loop. You know, where whatever they're producing. If it's born on a per item basis, they find out very quickly what they're producing that people like and what they're producing people don't like. Subscriptions are bundling of media, you know, and I think one of the reasons why Netflix really has too much content and too much of it is low quality is because of that bundling model. If you had more of a situation where people are paying per item of media, then it would really generate a strong feedback loop to creators as, as to what is really worth producing and what isn't. Very interesting. This whole conversation has been very enjoyable. And I am going to put a link to your a podcast too, because like I said, over the weekend, I enjoyed hearing a lot of a lot more from you. Do you have any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up? No, I mean, I'd, I'd just say thank you very much for taking the time to listen to what we've produced. You know, we're at a fairly yeah. early stage of our journey and to have somebody who's who's more mature in, the, in their path and kind of experienced podcaster to take an interest in what we're doing is, is fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thanks uh, very much, Simon Smith. We'll talk to you next time.